Welcome to Why Is This Good, a podcast by the Naples Writers Workshop. I'm Christine, and I'm here with John. Hey, John. Hello. All right, and this week it's John's turn. So, John, what did you pick? I picked the story River of Names by Dorothy Allison. I read this story around the time that we were first starting out this podcast. And ever since I read it, just little scenes and imagery from it just keeps popping back into my head. So finally I thought, I got, we have to talk about this one. My sister had her baby in a bad year. Before he was born, we had talked about it. Are you afraid? I asked. He'll be fine, she'd replied, not understanding, speaking instead to the other fear. Don't we have a tradition of bastards? He was fine, a classically ugly, healthy little boy with that shock of white hair that marks so many of us. But afterward, it was that bad year with my sister down with pleurisy, then cystitis, and no work, no money, having to move back home with my cold-eyed stepfather. I would come home to see her from the woman I could not admit I'd been with and take my infinitely fragile nephew and hold him, rocking him, rocking myself. One night I came home to screaming. The baby, my sister, no one else there. She was standing by the crib, bent over, screaming red-faced. Shut up, shut up. With each word, her fist slammed the mattress, fanning the baby's ear. Don't. I grabbed her, pulling her back, doing it as gently as I could so I wouldn't break the stitches from her operation. She had her other arm clamped across her abdomen and couldn't fight me at all. She just kept shrieking. That little bastard just screams and screams. That little bastard, I'll kill him. Then the words seeped in and she looked at me while her son kept crying and kicking his feet. By his head, the mattress still showed the impact of her fist. Oh no, she moaned. I wasn't going to be like that. I always promised myself. She started to cry, holding her belly and sobbing. We ain't no different. We ain't no different. You talked about wanting to read this because certain scenes had been like popping back into your head. But so what do you like about it? Oh man, what do I like about it? It's such a sad story. Mm -hmm. It's a difficult story too. I like it as a, um, this is difficult because it's not that I like the mood of the story, but I like it as a mood story, if you know what I mean. Yeah. It's a good example of that kind of thing. It's a, you know, a terrifying, horrible kind of situation, but it's so well presented in such an interesting way and it just sticks with you and it's really good i just like it as a well-written story when i was reading it it was one of these stories that's so horrific she's describing countless acts of child abuse growing up to her and her dozens of siblings like dozens of siblings and cousins or something like 66 on one side and she can't even remember all of their names and so with that many kids they're not only being abused and like horrible things are happening to each of them but they're also dying randomly some of them are killed and throughout like you said there's this mood that's dark but it's also she doesn't tell you these things like they're still affecting her necessarily she's just kind of like listing them so that every time her girlfriend in the scene kind of says something like oh your family what was that like oh what a big family yeah she's like yeah what a big family uh this is the terrible stuff that i'm thinking about when you say those things and she's not really upfront with her girlfriend throughout the piece about this she kind of doesn't elaborate at all which is why the girlfriend has this misconception about a happy upbringing but anyway she so she lists it in a way that's like for the benefit of the reader she's not like you know this really fucked me up she doesn't have to even tell you that she's like actually this is the reality let me list this for you and tell you why growing up it didn't strike me as wrong every time that something like this happened right so she she seems in a lot of ways immune to the memories at least like they've obviously shaped her in a way that she can't change but she doesn't seem to like think about them i don't know she doesn't seem like the kind of person that would go to a therapist and cry. No, she's trying to repress it. She has that scene where she wakes up screaming in the middle of the night and her girlfriend's like, I'm here, I'm here, and tries to like hold me, everything's all right. And then she says, ha ha, gotcha. Yeah. Then just tries to go back to sleep, but then can't because probably she was the nightmare of her childhood is just haunting her. I like her too because she's not looking for our pity. I don't think she's kind of like saying, this is why I am the way I am. She's just like, actually, this is the messed up stuff that happened. And this is why every time my girlfriend wants to talk about this, it's really hard to want to talk about it because it wasn't good. She seems to kind of be like grappling with it a little bit too. So like you said, it's it's a really sad story. I like it. For the same reason, though, because by the end, you have this definitive taste in your mouth. It leaves you with a certain feeling. And I imagine like every time you've thought about these scenes or the story itself, it's easy to kind of be brought back into that mood briefly or to recall that mood briefly, which I don't think you can do with every story. I think a lot of stories you can remember the plot. My best example of this is like Harry Potter. 
I've reread every Harry Potter book like 10 times or something crazy the first like four or five. And I remember all the plot for the most part, but like actually sitting down and cracking it open and reading it is different than I remember it, you know? Oh, interesting. But then like I'm looking at The Road on my desk, which I've talked about a million times because this book makes me cry. But Cormac McCarthy's The Road, when I think about the plot, like I am back in the mood itself too. It's one and the same. That's an interesting point. Yeah. I hadn't thought of that. That's good. It's good stuff, Christine. <laughs> That's the kind of thing you want to do in your story, right? You want your events to, you want it to linger in the, the reader's mind, not just like, oh, that was a cool thing that happened. But man, that really affected me. Right. And you talk all the time about like um, the dream state and interrupting the dream state in the experience of reading and how, you know, in, in the stuff that you're working on with this, how the best stories can immediately like bring you back into the mood and this is like obvious when you go to read like chapter 10 right you read chapter 9 two days ago and you're going to read chapter 10 and it only takes like a couple sentences before you're like back but it also works like in the middle of a chapter like you've described and that's not easily done sometimes I read books and it takes a lot longer for me to kind of remember like the flavor and sometimes that's because I've read it it's been too long since I last opened it up and and I'll get back into it. But other times it's like, because it's not really definitive. Yeah, I read a book recently that I can't say it really had a mood. A lot of things happened in this story and it was character driven. It was about the character, but I can't think of a mood for that story. I enjoyed the book. I would recommend it to people, but it's a different, um, it wasn't total in that way. So the one thing I realized when reading this, this is like a similar revelation I had for our last story, The Drinking Coffee Elsewhere by ZZ Packer, where I criticized the therapist as a device. And it was like a conscious thing I was noticing. So as I was reading this one, I was thinking about the couple times in our workshop where I've pointed out that some people were like guilty of using basically a list of past, not flashbacks, but scenes, but there was no forward momentum. It's just like this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. Oh, this happened, this happened. And it was written that way. It was written in a list. It wasn't trying to be something else, like a fully developed scene. But anyway, when I was reading this, I was like, okay, she's doing something very similar, but I'm okay with it. I didn't feel like each scene necessarily did a whole lot of work in terms of like telling me something different about her. I think she could have picked three of these and said, oh, the time, you know, my dad swung my sister by her arm and it broke. And I didn't know you could break an arm like that. Or the time my cousin got shot. But, you know, I'm, I'm trying to remember now examples. But I feel like she could have picked, like, some of the strongest ones and developed them. Or she could have done what she did here, which was, like, I mean, she really listed a bunch of stuff. And, like, every time you remembered that the story itself was, like, kind of taking place in a present tense moment where she's, like, in bed with her girlfriend, it wasn't totally clear. Now that I'm trying to remember, I think she's, like, in bed with her, like, talking to her. But that's also, like, kind of in flashback. At the end, at least, we're, like, in a scene in the present moment with a current girlfriend. The only explanation I could come up with is like, I'm especially guilty of enjoying this kind of like really morbid stuff. Like we're on season 11 of Law and Order SVU and we started from the beginning. Wow. Sex assault is interesting to me and that's terrible. So these kinds of stories of like child abuse, I'm just like, yeah, yeah, holy cow. Oh my God. Wow, wow, wow. And part of me is fascinated by it, right? So you can list these kind of things and I'm just like eating it up and the story read so fast. So I think there's an element like that like had this not been about child abuse had this been about I don't know something less horrific or le- or more familiar you would have gotten the sense that you were bored yeah I agree there's definitely an element of that if it was just like <laughs> the um, different ways of eating shrimp from Forrest Gump comes to mind yes. right but uh, well, <laughs> yeah but there's an arc to that you're like shut up and then it's like funny that's that's the thing you know it's I think what it is is the the, the specific details. It's not just a list of anything. It's a list of these vivid, concrete moments from her mm-hmm. life that you can read it and you can be there with her for those moments. I don't know. Somehow they're just evocative in a really strong way. And I think that being able to 
the difference between a list that's boring and a list that's engaging is I think um, how well it evokes that sense of being there. And this does that really, really well. Oh, yeah. And I think it comes from those details. It comes from specific details. So that was the other thing that I was kind of realizing in situations where I've criticized this. Like maybe there was an element where it felt repetitive because they were normal examples. It's like telling a story about like a person who grew up loving reading and you just list all the places they were found reading a book that were strange. Like after a while, that's not, unless you do the bubble grump thing, like it's not going to get like funny. It's just like kind of repetitive. It's like, okay, we get it. So yes, some part of this is like bizarre and strange and I'm fascinated by it. So like list all the details you want. I'll, I'll read them and eat it up. But then the other part of it, and it's obvious, but I think you have to point it out is that like, she's a great writer. And so there's <laughs> right. <laughs> like, the, we could talk about like the details and the mechanics of it, but like you can't teach the really, really, really great writing part of it, right? There's this other element that I think she has as a writer. The vision. It's vision. We never talk about it. Vision. And it's so hard to talk about. Yeah, because I don't, this is like the one part we talk about like our workshop, I think is a way to foster writing. We're fostering an atmosphere where you can hone this skill. You're going to have to do a lot of the work yourself. We can tell you certain things and you're going to have to learn it yourself though. We can't teach it to you. You're going to have to like go home confused and realize something on your own after practicing this and, or reading something on your own. But then like, even if the workshop works for you, there's going to be this element that just not everyone has. And it comes down to some of these like sentences and things where it's like this stroke of genius. We all have it occasionally, but some people like her, like you could tell have it often. And then the part where I was realizing that like, that's the other thing that was at play was like this section um, where she's talking about her cousin, Butch. She says, I loved my cousin Butch. He had this big old head, pale thin hair, and an enormous watery eyes. All the cousins did, though Butch's head was the largest, his hair the palest. I was the dark-headed one. All the rest of the family seemed pale carbons of each other in shades of blonde, though later on everybody's hair went brown or red and I didn't stand out so. That part about the family being pale carbons of each other, that was just one of these lines where I was like, now I'm noticing that the other part of what I am enjoying in this is because there's these beautiful lines that make me want to stop and underline them. Oh, yeah. That is part of it, isn't it? I mean, you talked about just getting lost in the dream of the story where if you're interrupted, you startle. But sometimes just the language is, it just jumps out at you too. It's part of the dream though, in that way. It's part of that feeling of being engrossed in the story is feeling the words as well. Yeah, and they're, and where they're placed and when they happen and when she decides to slow down and describe something that way, it all lends to the pace, which lends to the mood. You know, it's not as simple as saying like, and now I've earned a beautiful sentence and I'll put it right here. This is, okay, this is funny. When I'm talking about criticizing the fact that like part of this is is almost just like a rambling list, there's a paragraph that starts that way. It says, so I made a list. <laughs> oh, yeah. I told her that one went insane, got her little brother with an iron. The three of them slipped their arms, not the wrists, but the bigger veins up near the elbow. She, now she, now she strangled the boy she was sleeping with and got sent away. That one drank lie and died laughing soundlessly. In one year, I lost eight cousins. It was the year everybody ran away, four disappeared and were never found. One fell in the river and was drowned. One was run down hitchhiking north. One was shot running through the woods while Grace, the last one, tried to walk from Greenville to Greer for some reason nobody knew. She fell off the overpass a mile down from the Sears Roebuck warehouse and lay there for hunger and heat and dying. So it's a list, but the pace of each of those sentences, the way she's emphasizing one over the other, that's all also adding to how we're taking this in. Yeah, and that paragraph is written as if she's speaking it out loud. There's that line, she, now she strangled the boy because she is italicized there. So it's written like speech, like dialogue, not just narration. So it kind of helps the list to be spoken like that. I think of that Mark Twain story that nobody else liked, but he did some listing in that too, but he did it in that voice, whatever that guy's name voice was, that local 19th century voice. So it part of the, the, it was a list, but that voice also helped sell it plus the details plus everything else. So what else do you like about this or what else did you want to point out? What you mentioned about the list, 
uh, made me remember that, uh, you know, this isn't just this, um, like, this is a story in that it's she's confronting her past in the context of explaining herself to her girlfriend. And that's not clear. Like, like you said earlier, it's not clear if it happens over the course of several days, if it's all in one night, when she was woke up screaming or, but we know that they're having this conversation in some respect about what's your life like. And she's sometimes revealing it and sometimes not. And then at the end, as you tell the funniest stories, I put my hands behind her back, feeling the ridges of my knuckles pulsing. Yeah, I tell her, but I lie. And I'm not entirely sure if she's admitting to lying about the happy stories she made up to fill in her past, or if she's trying to take back everything she just said about the horrific stories that she's revealed. Oh, I read it the the latter. That's how I read it too, but... Yeah, you're right. It's not totally clear. I guess the other kind of context clue for me was, which is kind of what I liked about this piece, was the fact that that was the final sentence in it. We know probably that that's not going to be the end of the conversation. So I think what we're hoping is that now she's going to tell her girlfriend everything she already told us. We don't need to stick around for it. But Yeah, hear it twice. Yeah, yeah we already heard the shit. But we're hoping that by doing that, what she's doing right then is what our what the character in the ZZ Packer story didn't do, which was decide to change, right? To realize that they've been doing this thing. They've figured out why they do it and that's not good for them. They don't really want to do it, but they're the only ones that can like decide to change right to be honest about something and i read it as like kind of hopeful even though it's like it's a negative sentence too she's like i i lie about this that's how i took it too is hopeful is a good description i did too but i realized that it's not cut and dry yeah i don't think like she's gonna like necessarily heal from this but for me like that's not what i cared about so much as like yeah you should probably absolutely tell the person you've been dating for a year if you want to get past a certain point this is gonna have to come up and that's a positive step for this character in that relationship. I was like, oh, good for her. She's going to do it. Instead of like, I don't know, running this girl off somehow and then doing the same thing to the next girl. Yeah. Which is what I think our ZZ Packer girl did, right? She runs her girlfriend off, basically. Her first kind of love interest. She's like, I'm going to keep the wall that's always been here. I'm going to keep it up. And she knows she's doing that. Yeah, it could be. I mean, after these, this is so specifically told, there's no way that her girlfriend would believe her that she was lying about this. You know, although you tell the funniest stories line is odd too. Mm -hmm. I do think it's, as you say, hopeful. Even if she is trying to take any of it back, I don't think Jesse's going to let her. Yeah, right. You you say that, but come on. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, definitely where this goes from here is somewhere good. Right. Do you have a takeaway for this one? Uh, Hmm. I'm having trouble with mine. Yeah, I don't really have a specific takeaway. I guess form, I could take away form. Just right. um, We've talked about that just as a way to have your character's background play a role in a current kind of decisive moment in their current life. Because the form feels like a preamble or a setup. And then like the story itself, I think, is the conversation that is going to happen. Yeah, it could be. It feels like a preamble. It does. I I could see that. And I know she took this story. This story appears also in a book, a collection. Okay. um, Where it's semi-autobiographical or something where she kind of explored this even further. Okay. I think it's called Trash. That sounds about right. Yeah. But as a story on its own, I think it definitely captures the mood of a life and gives it current importance because of the relationship and allows those flashbacks to happen. Right. That might be a, a thing to study, to take away from it. Right. If I was like hard pressed to come up with something to mimic this form, like to find my own story to fit this way, like I, I think I'd I'd be thinking a long time. <laughs> yeah. But okay, so my takeaway is kind of similar because I I really do like the way it ended. As I'm reading this story, as I was reading it the first time, and like kind of like I said, thinking about the fact that this is it felt like a list, but it it wasn't repetitive. So like, what was she doing? I was wondering kind of throughout, like, where is this going to go? Like, what what's the point of this? And then like I said, the plot kind of happens off the page and it, we leave the story early, it feels like. We've learned a lot about her and then we're kind of assuming what she's going to do now. And, and it, it was satisfying, but I think there's 
like a lot of clever things that you could probably do in other stories where you kind of exit early. Like I feel like stories that peter out or wrap up too neatly could have done that. It's like your story kind of jumps the shark when you want to like see something completely through. Yeah, I, that's a good point. Knowing when the ending has happened, you don't have to play out the denouement to like the nth degree. Or even like, I feel like in, in short stories, especially when we see a piece where a writer has decided that it's going to be maybe a single scene, especially it's like the scene ends and the story ends. It's like, how about like next time, instead of watching the character leave the coffee shop, why don't you say something while the character is still at the coffee shop that feels like the ending of the story instead of the ending of the scene? Oh, I get it. Yeah. And I think this goes to the fact that I like what we talked about last episode, which is like these subtle stories, these re- these realizations that happen in your head. Because I, I always, a lot of times I feel like I come up with a story ending. I'll think of something and I'm like, yeah, that that's a good mood or that's like a feeling that I want to like leave someone with. And so I'm always thinking about like the ending that way. And I know usually where I'm going to end it feeling wise, but I feel like stories that I don't like have usually been conceived of like as a plot from start to finish or something. And I'm like, great. We got the whole story. I'm all done now. Even Harry Potter does this, okay? Let's talk more about Harry Potter, the only book that I've read multiple times. The first three books follow the same pattern where Harry goes on a tremendous adventure and inevitably gets knocked out cold at the end of each one. And then the story could be over then, except that he wakes up and then has usually a scene in a hospital bed where someone is telling him what happened and how it wrapped up. Oh, really? Wow, okay. Oh my God, it happens like three or four times where it's like, Harry, wake up. You're in the infirmary, Harry. Anyway, so it could end when the plot ends, but it doesn't. We kind of like revisit him and maybe he has some revelation or they kind of hint at what's next type thing. I don't love those endings, but I feel like it's kind of a nod to the idea that like, yeah, the plot's over, but like, is the story. Oh, yeah. We concluded this, but like, what was the takeaway? We have to wake Harry back up now. He was knocked out by the dragon. Now we got to wake him back up because we need to know what he thinks of all of it, right? The plot's over, but like, we haven't synthesized it. That's what's important. I mean, a plot is just a series of events, right? But what makes it a story is the plot's impact on a character so if he's just knocked out by some event we don't know what what the story is <laughs> yeah it feels really cheap that way but i feel like i feel like i often read kind of these stories that are like working towards something but the reason they're not satisfying is because we've left them when the story ended and that I think is my takeaway because I think when you decide to not tell your reader like the whole story or if you decide like that's all you need to know those kind of frustrating endings almost where you're kind of craving more those are more satisfying like we talk all the time about TV shows jumping the shark and it's because they knew they had a good thing and they didn't know when to stop because of that right but like the best shows the ones that we love are the ones that end before the heyday's over and and literally leave you wanting more it's like they might have even ended of the plot and they decided they were done and they're done it's over it's done it's like game of thrones we would watch it for 20 more years but at some point we get it yeah i think of breaking bad that was the the story had just arrived at where it needed to arrive and that was it right and we see this too not to like belabor this but in tv shows especially that are like sitcom style like the office the office totally jumps a shark the the story's over if you compare the american office to the british office the british office is probably better and it's because it ends after two seasons in a christmas special right as jim and pam are about to fuck and you're you're like i want to see this play out and then the american office is like i'll let you play it out and then like pam has kids and she gets lame and you're like wait a second well yeah that's i mean the story that drives that situation is jim and pam what's going on with them and when they get together it's over it's over exactly exactly and then they got to invent all these other things because they know what you love about the show can be done over and over you love the humor it can be done over and over just like this story could continue to list things in perpetuity but eventually i'll be like i get it yeah leave early we mentioned that episodes go in out or in in late in late out early yeah now i'm in late i've always understood but the out early now i'm I'm like getting that more and more oh yeah very good sometimes i worry that i I leave a story too quickly yeah you're like well it's my bedtime so (laughs) well thanks guys if you enjoyed this episode, consider subscribing to our monthly newsletter at our website, NaplesWritersWorkshop.com. And for daily writing tips, industry news, and great short fiction, join our Facebook group at facebook.com groups slash Naples Writers Workshop.